Hey guys, it's week five and we're talking about metals. We're gonna be reading from the Usborne Science Encyclopedia, Fizz, Bubble, and Flash, and DK Eyewitness Chemistry. Groups of metals. Metals can be grouped according to their chemical properties and the way they behave. There are five main groups of metals called noble metals, alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, poor metals, and transition metals. The noble metals are also transition metals. The copper in this ore has not reacted with any other elements. Copper is a noble metal. All right, so let's break those down. Noble metals. Noble metals are those that can be found as pure metals, not as parts of compounds in the Earth's crust. These metals are copper, palladium, silver, platinum, and gold. The noble metals are all unreactive. They do not easily combine with other elements to form compounds. Because they are unreactive, noble metals do not easily corrode when they are used for jewelry and coins. Gold is very unreactive and ancient gold objects are still shiny. This is an ancient Greek gold mask. It was untarnished when they found it. Alkali metals. The alkali metals are six very reactive metals, including sodium and potassium, that form group one of the periodic table. They have low melting points. Potassium melts at 147 degrees Fahrenheit, and they are soft and can be cut with a knife. They form alkaline solutions when they react with water, which is why they are called alkali metals. And as we know, potassium reacts violently with water, giving off hydrogen that bursts into lilac colored flames. And alkaline earth metals. The alkaline earth metals are six metals, including magnesium, calcium, and barium that form group two of the periodic table. These metals are found in many different minerals around the earth's crust. For example, calcium is found in calcite which forms veins in limestone and chalk. Alkali earth metals are not as reactive as the alkali metals and they are harder and have higher melting points. This shell contains large amounts of calcium in the form of calcium carbonate. Magnesium is found in chlorophyll, the green pigment needed by plants for photosynthesis. Transition metals. The transition metals can be regarded as typical metals. They're strong, hard, and shiny, and have high melting points. They are less reactive than the alkali and alkaline earth metals. Iron, gold, silver, chromium, nickel, and copper are all transition metals. They're easy to shape and have many different industrial uses, both on their own and as alloys. Poor metals. The poor metals are a group of nine metals, aluminum, gallium, indium, tin, antimony, thallium, lead, bismuth, and polonium. They are grouped to the right of the transition metals in the periodic table. In general, they are quite soft and are not much use on their own. Many are used to make more useful substances though. And lastly, we have rare earth elements. These are a group of 17 elements, the lanthanoids, scandium, yttrium, and lutetium. They are found in almost every car, gadget, and household appliance, and so have become some of the world's most valued resources. Most of the world's supply of the rare earths is now mined in China. If you would like to learn more about this, you can scan the QR code and be taken to Usborne's Quick Links. Chemical reactions. Chemical reactions can happen naturally without human intervention. Reactions happen in living things by making use of proteins called enzymes in complex catalytic reactions. Humans can also make chemical reactions happen to provide some of the products we use every day. When a chemical reaction takes place, atoms are rearranged and new chemical substances are formed. 
The starting materials in a chemical reaction are called reactants that react to form products. In a chemical reaction, there are changes of energy, often in the form of heat. If heat is given off, the reaction is said to be exothermic. If heat is absorbed, this is an endothermic reaction. Some chemical reactions are reversible. Some are difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. In a chemical reaction, a compound may be prepared or synthesized from its elements. For example, iron and sulfur form iron sulfide when they are heated together. A compound can also be broken down. For example, heating metal ores to obtain metals. The ozone layer. Ozone is a reactive gas that contributes to pollution when it builds up in the atmosphere over cities. However, ozone in the stratosphere does the useful task of absorbing damaging ultraviolet light from the sun, screening it from the earth. Some synthetic chemicals, especially chlorofluorocarbons, react with ozone, creating holes in the ozone layer. These holes allow more UV light through, tending to cause an increase in skin cancer. Plants make carbohydrates to build up stems, trunks, leaves, and roots in a process called photosynthesis. Plants take in water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use light energy from the sun to convert them to carbohydrates. They also produce oxygen as a byproduct, which they release into the atmosphere through their leaves. So now we're gonna look at a displacement reaction. When a coil of copper is dipped into a solution of silver salt, the copper displaces the silver in the salt. Copper is able to do this because it is higher in the reactivity series of metals. Copper and silver nitrate are the reactants in this reaction, and copper nitrate and silver metal are the products. This is called a displacement reaction because one metal has displaced another metal from a solution of one of its salts. So here we have silver nitrate dissolved in water in the jar and then there's a copper coil, two different widths. This one has been more like pounded and this one is um, like more roundish. Um, so it says here, number one, the reactants. The coils of copper are dipped into a flask of silver salt in a solution. In this reaction, the salt is the colorless silver nitrate. As soon as the copper coil and the salt solution come into contact, the silver is precipitated out of the solution. That is, it becomes an insoluble solid and can be seen as the metal clinging in crystals to the copper strip. The solution turns blue because copper ions displace silver ions in the solution to produce copper nitrate. The equation can be written like this. So you have copper ions displacing silver ions to produce copper nitrate. And silver. Rocket fuel. The space shuttle sits on a large fuel tank holding liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in separate containers. They are mixed in the correct proportion and react to provide power. The hydrogen burns in oxygen with a clean flame producing water, seen here as steam. Making a precipitate. Both potassium iodine and lead nitrate are salts that are soluble in water. They form colorless solutions. However, lead iodine is insoluble. So when the two solutions are mixed, yellow lead iodine is precipitated out of the solution. The other product, potassium nitrate, is colorless and soluble and therefore remains in the solution. This type of reaction is useful for making compounds that are insoluble. The solid precipitate can be filtered off and washed. It can also be used to recognize chemicals in unknown substances. Chemistry in the kitchen. 
Like most chemical reactions involving living things, the process of making dough is controlled by enzymes which act as catalysts. These start to work as soon as the rising agent, yeast, is mixed with warm water and sugar. Yeast is a living organism that needs air and moisture to grow. Sugar provides the food. Bubbles of carbon dioxide are produced, and when the mixture is added to flour and water to make dough, the dough rises. Heating kills the yeast and bakes the dough. Ernest Rutherford was the first person to bombard atoms artificially to produce transmutated elements. The physicist from New Zealand described atoms as having a central nucleus with electrons revolving around it. He showed that radium atoms emitted rays and were transferred into radon atoms. Nuclear reactions like this can be regarded as transmutations, one element changing into another, the process alchemists sought in vain to achieve by chemical means. Meet the elements. Take a look around you. Everything you see and the many things you can't see are made up of materials called elements. They are the building blocks that make up everything around us on Earth, even in us, and out in space too. Whether a gas, a liquid, or solid, everything around you is made up of some combination or grouping of these 100 plus chemical building blocks. Important? You bet. Without them, the world as we know it wouldn't exist. So let's have some fun and find out what these awesome things we call chemical elements are all about. It's elementary. Elements are made of only one kind of atom. By themselves, or combined with other elements, they make up everything in the universe. What is an element? And other questions with answers. Whether you know it or not, you're already familiar with many of these elements like sodium, copper, silver, mercury, and aluminum. Others have strange sounding names, such as neodymium and americium, the helium in a party balloon, the gold in a necklace, and the carbon in charcoal are all elements. And so is the silicon in a computer memory chip and the iron in your fortified breakfast cereal. But I thought that the smallest bits of something were called atoms. And you're right. Atoms are the smallest particles of an element that can exist and still be that element. Some of the things around you are made up of atoms of the same element. The helium in that balloon, the carbon in charcoal, the aluminum in aluminum foil, or the oxygen in the air you breathe. Think of them like various Lego creations made by connecting pieces of exactly the same shape, size, and color into combinations of atoms. But you'd probably get pretty bored with your Legos if you could only build towers out of identical pieces. You'd probably like to mix them up. Well, atoms feel the same way. So, most substances are made of groups of two or more different types of atoms stuck together. These groups are called molecules or compounds. Our world would be awfully dull if everything were made only of pure element combinations. So, it's a good thing that so many things are made up of molecules. For example, a molecule of water has one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms. Its chemical formula is H2O, an H for hydrogen with a little two to show there are two atoms of it in each molecule and a single O for oxygen. There are small molecules, medium-sized ones, and even giant molecules with thousands of atoms. The cotton or nylon clothes we wear contain long stringy molecules with strange sounding names like cellulose and polyamide. Your body is made from thousands of different kinds of molecules, water, proteins, and fats to name a few. So, atoms are the smallest particles that are just one element, and molecules are combinations of atoms of the same or different elements. Either way, it's back to elements again. Who discovered the elements? Humans have been discovering elements ever since they started exploring the world. The first elements were found so long ago, we don't know who discovered them. 
People have been using elements such as gold, iron, and copper for thousands of years. As humans started experimenting with the rocks and minerals they found around them, they uncovered other elements. Tin from the mineral cassiterite. Mercury from the mineral cinnabar. And carbon from burning wood. They didn't call them elements back then though. The discovery of elements really started to take off around 1700 when scientists started figuring out what kinds of stuff the world was made of. They were able to isolate or separate out the elements hidden in many common materials. Between 1700 and the early 1900s, most of the 90 natural elements were discovered. Then in the 1940s, scientists realized that they could create totally new elements in the laboratory. So far, scientists have discovered or created more than 112 elements and they're still making more. Can I discover an element? We're not missing any natural elements, so you won't find any just lying around. If you want to help create a new element, you could study chemistry or physics in college and then go to work in one of the labs that creates new elements. But how about working with the elements that we already have? Chemists are scientists who try to combine elements to make new molecules or to better understand the ones we already have. A new molecule might become a medicine that helps sick people, a detergent that cleans better, or a fuel that doesn't pollute the environment. And yes, you can create it. So how do scientists keep all these elements straight? To organize and keep track of all the different elements, scientists have given each one a number and a nickname like the H for hydrogen. And group them by similarities. A lot like the way different instruments are grouped in an orchestra. With elements though, the arrangement is called the periodic table. The particular spot that an element has is important because elements in the same column or family are chemical cousins and act in much the same way just as the individual instruments in a musical family, woodwinds, brass, etc., sit together and sound similar. Together, these groupings form the orchestra of every element here on Earth and beyond. Presenting the periodic table. You've just learned that everything around you is built from about 100 different kinds of really small building blocks called chemical elements. Each of these elements gets its own special box on the periodic table. Each box usually shows the symbol, the atomic number, and the atomic mass. The atomic numbers start at the top left, beginning with H, number one, and read left to right, row by row, just like the lines in a book. Families of elements that behave in similar ways are grouped in columns. Some families are metals and some are gases. Here's one element up close and you can see how all the elements are arranged on page 10. So here's beryllium and it just points out to you where you can find the atomic number, the atomic mass, the name, and the symbol. And then on page 10, what they were referring to is that there's a picture of the periodic table there, which you guys have a copy of this in your notebook. So who first thought of the periodic table? For a long time, scientists realized that many elements seem to be related to one another. But trying to organize this information was like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle with a lot of pieces missing when you don't even know what the picture is supposed to look like. In 1869, a clever Russian chemist named Dmitry Mendeleev figured out some of the answers to the puzzle. He even predicted which elements were missing and how they would behave. Scientists later filled in the blanks and found that his predictions were right. The name game. Gold's nickname is AU. Lead's is PB and potassium's is K. What's up with that? Usually one or two letter nicknames for the elements are easy to remember. N for nitrogen and O for oxygen, for example. Other elements are named after famous scientists. 
ES for Einsteinium, named after Albert Einstein. After countries, FR for Francium, named after France. Or for the places they were discovered, YB for Utterbium, named after the town of Utterby in Sweden. There are some strange symbols that are harder to recognize though, because the names come from other languages. Gold symbol, AU, only makes sense if you know that the Latin word for this metal is aurum. The same is true of lead, whose symbol is PB, from the Latin plumbum. And sometimes the symbol refers to another name for the element, such as the W for tungsten, which is also called wolfram, from the mineral wolframite. If you discovered an element, what would you call it? Can you turn your own name into one for an element? Try adding eum or just um to the end. You might end up with Isabellium, Stevenium, or Georgium. Or would you prefer to name a scientific discovery after your friends or members of your family, your town, or even your pet? Who knows, maybe someday you just might get the chance. Baxterium? I'm flattered. I hear about plutonium and uranium in the news. How come? Most of the atoms that make up the different elements are very stable. The little pile of protons and neutrons in the nucleus will stick around forever. But the atoms of some elements are unstable. They have trouble holding themselves together. These atoms fall apart, losing or gaining more protons. This can give off a lot of energy and changes them into a different element altogether. Scientists call such atoms radioactive and the energy they give off can be very powerful, even dangerous when used in certain ways. One of the uses of plutonium and uranium, for example, is in nuclear weapons. But many radioactive elements are very helpful to us when used carefully. Doctors and dentists, for example, use x-rays from radioactive compounds to help diagnose medical problems, like checking for cavities in your teeth. A periodic poem. Each element has a spot on the periodic table, whether metal or gas, radioactive or stable. You can find out its number, its symbol, its weight, and from its position, its physical state. Elements lined up in columns and rows. The reason for this order, as each chemist knows, is that atoms are made up of still smaller bits. Figuring this out tested scientists' wits. In the nucleus, protons and neutrons are found, and a cloud of electrons is buzzing around. First, take one proton, put it in its place. Now you have hydrogen, the simplest case. Add two neutrons and one more proton, and suddenly the hydrogen's gone. Now you have helium, quite different stuff. You get the picture, I've said enough. These tiny particles, they're like building blocks that make people and buildings flowers and rocks. They create all of the elements we find in everyday things of every kind. Forming salts. Salts can be prepared by mixing an acid with a base or a metal. If the acid is sulfuric acid, the salt is called sulfate. Hydrochloric acid forms salts called chlorides. Nitric acid forms salts called nitrates. Salts are ionic compounds consisting of a positive ion, usually metal, and a negative ion, which may be a nonmetal or a group of atoms bound together. The best known salt is probably sodium chloride, an essential part of our diet. Not all salts are harmless. Thallium salts were used as rat poison. If allowed to form slowly, salts become regularly shaped crystals. Some are soluble in water, some are not. Their solubility can be used to determine which metals are present in substances. Some salts take up water from the air. They are deliquescent. Some salt crystals gradually lose their attached water. They are efflorescent. 
Sometimes salts come out of solution in inconvenient ways. Kettles and central heating pipes become clogged up with calcium and magnesium salts in areas with hard water. The common salt, sodium chloride, is called common or table salt. Traces of another edible salt, magnesium carbonate, are added to help it flow. This is copper nitrate, copper sulfate, copper hydroxide, copper turnings, copper oxide, and copper carbonate. So these were different salts from copper. The metal copper, like other metals, forms a wide variety of salts. The copper salts shown here can be prepared in many different ways. Copper oxide can be prepared by heating the metal with air. It is used as pigment. Copper carbonate will yield carbon dioxide and copper oxide on heating. The green color on copper roofs is a form of copper carbonate. Copper chloride is soluble in water. It is used as a catalyst. Copper hydroxide comes out of a solution when alkali is added to soluble copper salts. Copper sulfate forms hydrated crystals. It is used in agriculture as a fungicide. Copper nitrate is very soluble and will even take up water from the air and dissolve itself. Here you see a ruby and an emerald. Emerald is mainly the colorous mineral, beryl. It owes its green color to the presence of tiny amounts of the green salt, chromium oxide. Rubies are chiefly made up of aluminum oxide in the form of corundum, a hard natural mineral. Pure corundum is colorless, and ruby gets its red color from the same chromium salt because it is forced into the crystal structure of corundum, causing its spectrum to shift. Here is a water purifier. Tap water contains a number of impurities that impair the taste, cause the buildup of scale in kettles, and form a scum with soaps. Many impurities are salts that can be removed by a process called ion exchange. This uses a resin made up of small plastic beads with ions bonded to their surface. They replace positive metal ions, such as aluminum and calcium, with hydrogen ions, and they replace negative ions, such as nitrate, with hydroxide ions. Hydrogen and hydroxide ions make up water. So here they describe it. Um, we'll start at the top. There, the cap traps waterborne solids. Ion exchange resin removes positive and negative ions. Charcoal absorbs organic pollutants like pesticides. And then the final filter for any remaining waterborne solids. So here's the same filter, uh, but they're showing it, they're illustrating the ions now this time. Positive metal ions are trapped and replaced with hydrogen ions. Negative ions are trapped and replaced with hydroxide ions. The hydrogen and hydroxide ions combine to form water. The prism in this desiccator is made up of rock salt and is used for spectroscopy. It must be kept absolutely dry, otherwise it will deteriorate. The atmosphere is kept dry using silica gel a hydrated form of silicon dioxide that absorbs water very efficiently. It is colored blue by another salt, cobalt, cobalt chloride, which turns pink in the presence of water. The ingredients in glass. Glass is made from several salts. The main constituent is silicon dioxide in the form of sand. Limestone, calcium carbonate, and sodium carbonate are also added to make the common soda glass used for bottles. The greenish tinge of old glass is due to iron impurities in the sand. Other metal salts can be added to the mix to make colored glass. Meet the alkali metals.
The first column of the periodic table, way on the left, contains the elements called the alkali metals. All of them except hydrogen are metals. You know something about what metals are already. They're often shiny, even reflecting light, and they conduct heat. Think of how a metal spoon gets warm if you leave it in hot cocoa. And you'll find out on page 14 that metals also conduct electricity. Most metals are also malleable, which means that they're easily bent, shaped, or molded, just like that metal spoon again. You'll never find a spoon made of an alkali metal though, or even run into one of those alkali metals on its own in nature. They just don't hang around long enough. This family of elements is the most reactive of all the metals. Its members combine really fast with other elements. A piece of pure alkali metal reacts in the blink of an eye. When exposed to water or air, they can be pretty wild, bursting into flames and giving off lots of very bright light. So what do alkali metals have to do with you? Well, they help you season your food for one. You have plenty of alkali metals lurking around your house combined with other elements. Check them out. Hydrogen. Hydrogen, the first element, is an old H2O. It's also a gas that caused the Hindenburg to blow. Look up at the stars, they're hydrogen too. And there's H in our bodies, in me and in you. What holds the hydrogen and oxygen atoms together in a water molecule? All atoms have a lot of electrons whizzing around. When the hydrogen and the oxygen get close together, they share electrons. This sharing is called a chemical bond. And as you know, it's nice to bond and it's good to share. Hydrogen has the symbol H. It's number one on the periodic table with a mass of 1.01. .01. And it was discovered in 1766 by Henry Cavendish. Water and carbon both conduct electricity, providing a pathway along which it flows. When wires are connected to a battery, electrons travel around and around in a circle from the battery along one wire, through the lead, across the water, through the other leaden wire, and back into the battery. As this electrical current passes through the water, it breaks water, H2O, into its elements, hydrogen and oxygen. You will see bubbles forming along the leads, and those are the gases, hydrogen along one and oxygen along the other. This is a process called electrolysis that you can demonstrate at home with your parents' help. So what they've done here is they've taken a nine volt battery and they've connected wires with alligator clips to pencil lead, not the wooden pencil, but just the piece of lead that's inside. And they placed it in water. And so what happens is the electrical current becomes complete because the lead and the water are both good conductors. So the electricity, the current comes through the lead and then it crosses across the water up to the other lead and then taken through the wire back into the battery. And the cool thing that you can see is you'll see bubbles forming around the ends of the lead that are in the water. One side is hydrogen and the other side is oxygen gases causing the bubbles. Two H's and an O. The chemical formula for water, H2O, tells you a lot about its makeup. Each water molecule is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. These elements exist separately as something quite different from the molecule of water they form when they combine. Someday you may drive a car powered by hydrogen. Scientists are trying to make non-polluting automobile engines. Using hydrogen as a fuel instead of gasoline just may be the answer. These clean engines would combine hydrogen and oxygen from the air. So instead of nasty air pollution, the only thing come out of your car would be water. These engines are powerful too. They are even used to launch rockets into space. Right now, they're too heavy and expensive to put in cars, but scientists are trying to make them lighter and less expensive. 
Here's a funny cartoon of hydrogen gas and it says, I could go off at any minute. So the big H, hydrogen is not only the first element in the periodic table, but it's number one in quantity too. There is more hydrogen in the universe than any other element. Stars are made of it and hydrogen roams through space between the stars as well. On Earth, most hydrogen is found in water and other kinds of molecules rather than by itself. And the blimp. We're lucky that most hydrogen atoms are tied up in compounds like water because hydrogen gas by itself is very explosive. A fact that made headlines all around the world in the early 1900s. Have you ever seen old photos or movies about the Hindenburg disaster? The Hindenburg, a hydrogen-filled passenger airship, was the largest aircraft ever to fly. On May 6, 1937, as the airship was trying to make a much delayed landing in Lakehurst, New Jersey, it caught fire and crashed, killing 35 of the 97 people aboard and one ground crew member. But don't worry about the blimps you see today. They are full of lightweight helium, a gas that does not burn. ASAP Science presents the elements of the periodic table. There's hydrogen and helium, then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon everywhere, nitrogen all through the air with oxygen so you can breathe in fluorine for your pretty teeth, neon to light up the sign, sodium for salty times, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, then sulfur, chlorine, then argon, potassium, and calcium so you'll grow strong, scandium, titanium, vanadium, and chromium, and manganese, this is the periodic table, no gas is stable, Allergens and alkali react aggressively Each period will see new outer shells While electrons are added moving to the right Iron is the 26th in cobalt, nickel coins you get Copper, zinc, and gallium, germanium, and arsenic Selenium and bromine film while krypton helps light up your room Rubidium and strontium, then yttrium, zirconium Niobium, molybdenum, technetium Ruthenium, rhodium, palladium Silverware, then cadmium and indium Tin cans, antimony, then tellurium And iodine and xenon and then cesium and Barium is 56 and this is where the table splits Where lanthanides have just begun Lanthanum, cerium and praseodymium Neodymium's next to promethium, then 62 Samarium, europium, gadolinium, and terbium Dysprosium, holium, erbium, thulium, ytterbium, luteum Hafnium, tantalum, tungsten, then we're on to rhenium, osmium, and iridium, platinum, gold, to make you rich till you grow old, mercury, to tell you when it's really cold, thallium, and lead the bismuth for your tummy, polonium, astatine would not be yummy, radon, francium will last a little time, radium, then actinize at 89, this is the Periodic table, novel gas is stable, halogens and alkali react aggressively. Each period will see new outer shells will electrons are to the right. Actinium, thorium, protactinium, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, americium, curium, berkelium, californium, isinium, fermium, and olivium, nobelium, laurentium, rutherfordium, wm, spurium, borium, hesium, lumitinarium, dubsidium, rocanium, copernicium, nimonium, flerovium, moscovium, livermorium, tennessine, and organism, and then we're done.